Let me introduce myself before I introduce Tony. I'm John Schaefer from WNYC Radio, the host of Soundcheck and New Sounds. And over the years, oh, an applaud. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize until just now that there is a singular version of applause. Yeah. <laughs> that was the sound of one hand laughing. Over the years, Tony Fletcher has come to our studio, it seems, almost every time he's published a book. And instead of bringing him into the studio, we are here tonight at Bowery Electric with uh, the best of jamming. And Tony Fletcher, applause. <laughs> So, an obvious first question, but I may not mean it in the obvious way. Why did you do this? The most simple answer is it seemed like fun at the time. Okay, not the question I was asking. Why did you do oh. this now? It seemed like fun at the time. <laughs> and I don't learn from my past mistakes. And what I thought would be a really simple process of putting together an anthology was a lot of work, but I did feel that it's a good time in general to look back on this period of pop culture or, or anti-pop culture as well. And I felt that there was potentially, if not a market for it, then a, perhaps a need for it. But, you know, the, the things like this that are all out there being eBayed deserve a place to be compiled and collected. And you know, it's funny, people our age who grew up with the music that's covered in, in jailing, we have a kind of built-in sense of nostalgia for this. So you would expect that those would be the people who are looking back fondly at the music of the late 70s, early 80s. But in fact, there's all these young bands who seem to have suddenly discovered, especially the early 80s, what we in the, in the States call the second British invasion. And so there's surprisingly a second kind of generation of nostalgists for this music, and they haven't lived through it. No, and I think that started as early as going back 20 years when I was still living in New York City and after 9-11 when there was that old downtown New York scene. It was really based around the post-punk sounds from the UK, which was something I was fortunate enough to live through and, and to some extent took for granted. And the more we go on, it's 20 years later, that sound is still incredibly influential. It was an unbelievably fertile period. And again, I feel really fortunate to have, to have had a sort of front row seat for much of it. They say that nostalgia goes in 20 year wave in 2001 and 2002. It, not surprising that people are looking back to 1981, 82. Are we now looking back to 2001, 2002's nostalgia? We may be, but I may also be the wrong person to ask. And one of the interesting things that I think just I can certainly talk to this bar closes about pop culture in general and trends. And at the time, bands had very short lifespans. I just asked you if you knew, knew about that band Au Pairs, two albums and done. And now bands that formed back then, I think the Strokes are still with us. But it's every few years, isn't it? It's not like these short bursts of activity and then the bands break up. What about Soft Cell? But the, a lot of these groups have come back, of course. Yeah, right. yeah. One big record, 1980. One, I want to say, yeah, yeah, you're right. and then almost nothing until a, a kind of short-lived reunion 20 years later, and now they're back again Yeah, with the Pet Shop Boys of yeah. all people are doing a, a collaborative song together. Let's go back to those, those halcyon days of the first wave of punk just down the block. I was in high school, was spending a fair amount of my youth at what was then CBGB's mm. and, and hearing what was happening here in New York. At the same time, you were in London, hearing what was happening there. What was your experience of that? What made you do what's inside of this? Sure. My experience was I was uh, maybe a little like you, John. I was fortunate enough. Um, again, I think a lot of this is good fortune. I lived in London. I went to a secondary school, meaning a high school, just south of the river in Kensington Oval. And really, my memory is a lot of us were musical in terms of we thought we, we, we loved music. But I remember going into the summer of 77 that most of us thought we loved hard rock. And we were uh, just coming into our third year of school. So we were all leaving that summer at age 13 in my age group. And we came back after the summer just saying, oh, my God, did you see Top of the Pops over the summer? Now, this would be the most commercial groups, but did you see, you know, 
But when the Sex Pistols were on top of the box and pretty vacant, did you see that? Did you see the Stranglers? Did you see the Boomtown Rats? Did you see the Jam? There were kids in my school who saw the Sex Pistols swear on TV with Bill Grundy. I never got to see it because obviously no VHS, but also the thing was like, it was not repeated. This was not one of these like, Oscar moment that uh, gets repeated. This was like, weird. there is no way. It was about 15 years till I ever saw that incident on television. It was just like legend. But we came back and suddenly this music had, had come down from being played by ancient people, i.e. people who were 30, <laughs> and it was being played by people who were 20, with the exception of the Stranglers, of course. But it was being played by people who were our age. And suddenly this felt exciting. We were buying records and I basically read in one of the music papers, Britain had four weekly music papers, all of which were selling in the six figures per week. And I read a, a spread in sounds about fanzines. And genuinely, I thought, hey, I could do one of these. And I said about doing it. And at what point did you realize a, maybe I can't do this, and B, I'm going to do it anyway. It wasn't that hard to put together a first issue. I mean, it was abysmal. It was terrible. And in the book, which we have up back here, I reprinted at least the front cover from that, and I think one other page. It, it was truly awful. But the point was, I asked one friend coming out of that math lesson that I was reading, because I was reading sounds under the desk at school. I was already bored of school. And I asked one friend coming out of the class if he wanted to do it with me. And, and for reasons he still doesn't uh, uh, understand, he said, because he's still got the coolest music taste I know. He recommended another kid in the class who liked heavy metal, hard rock music. He said yes. So the first couple of the first four issues we did at school were just this very schizophrenic combination of kind of the jam and rush. And they were printed on a school machine. They, those were not too hard to put together. But even by the third of those issues, I was feeling like, I want to make this, even if it's a school magazine, a really good one. And then it got difficult once I decided the next summer that I wanted to take it seriously and get out and print it properly. Then it got to be hard work. As you mentioned, there are copies of the book back there. And if any of you need to leave early, there are copies of Tony's other books as well. There's St. Patrick and they'll take care of you, such a... So the first <laughs> edition was not called Jamming. No. I had to chuckle when I saw the sort of handwritten cover, the story of Led Zeppelin. <laughs> yeah, I know. We printed 50 copies. And I can pretty much guarantee that 49 of them were thrown away very quickly. And I kept one at the bottom of my box of jammings for a long time. Only in doing this book did I sort of really dare reprint it because I thought, well, at least you can see the progression and now... I don't have to be embarrassed about it. I did not write that story of uh, Led Zeppelin. That was my hard rock friend, but I wrote my share of bad copy. Yeah. It's a purely practical question, but I'm always amazed when people who start on something actually think to kind of document, to keep a record of it. I do not have the first six months of my radio show. I have everything, almost everything after that. It just never occurred to me. And well, no, you're in good... You're in good company, because when I interviewed Paul McCartney, he said he really wished he kept a copy of every single, and he hadn't even done that. Yeah. So, yeah. Robert Fripp of King Crimson has everything from the 50-year history of that band. And it seems like you have that same kind of intuition or whatever it is to keep stuff as you go along. Yeah, and it, it's been hard because even it's amazing that this stuff followed me through emigrating and that period in life that many of us have where we live in three different places every year for two or three years. Some of what I kept, I felt that it didn't take up that much space compared to, for example, records. I, the interview manuscripts I've held on to. Yeah, I've got all the interview manuscripts. I've held on to quite a few of the cassette tapes. I've been listening back to them. They're in pretty bad. But, I, but the, when I knew there was a really good interview, I would try and hold on to it and not tape over it with another interview. Although... I will say that I had no money pretty much all the time I was doing this, so cassettes were a premium. Right. And I did tape over a lot of interviews. Then again, the BBC taped over all their old uh, Doctor Whos, didn't they? Yeah. Again, we're in good company. Thank you. <laughs> so, early on, there's an interview with Adam Ant mm -hmm. before he's MTV's Adam Ant. Mm -hmm. He's still Adam Ant. One word. He's adamant about being adamant. <laughs> what struck me about that interview wasn't so much anything he said. Uh, you admit that you hadn't heard a note of his music before interviewing him. <laughs> Ballsy, respect. But what impressed me was he said something and then you had a follow-up question. 
which beginning interviewers usually don't have. You, you come in with your set of questions. We are going to ask these questions. You ask question one, you get the answer. Check, you move on to question two. You then follow up question. Something about, he was talking about his audience and they're all 17 and you said something like, yeah, but in 10 years, they're all going to be old. <laughs> they're be like 26. Right? <laughs> and I don't remember what his answer was, but I was just impressed with the question. The fact that as a neophyte interviewer, you didn't just tick off boxes on a list. How did you, where did that kind of instinct come from? Well, that... John, it's a really good question because I, I wasn't even aware of that until genuinely not aware of that. I think that I had, I guess, some of this that you're also not aware of at the time. It takes a long way through your life to be able to look back on and realize that maybe your path has set out for you. My mother is an English teacher and quite hip in her own way, though also very into opera, but also very into pop music. My dad, with whom I had a very difficult relationship, was quite big in school's music, but he wasn't, he, he was gone by the time I was quite young. And I think that kind of combination of music and, and writing was probably in there somewhere. And I guess the family that I was in and the, the primary school I went to encouraged debate. And I think I was probably always looking forward to the opportunity to interview musicians and be able to have conversations with them. So I guess that the first opportunities I had, which were uh, Paul Weller and Adam Ann, almost back to back, I think almost about a week apart, I was ready to have a conversation. Um, I, I guess that was just something that had been building up even at the age of 14. The word you just used, the key word there is conversation. Because a, an interview, a bad interview is not a conversation. A bad interview is Q&A. A good interview is conversation. Which is why I trail this as us being in conversation, because I don't think you can do that. I agree. I agree. And sometimes I have been interviewed and you hear somebody ticking. Yeah, you can almost. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's not great. I may as well just send you email questions. Right. In case. Yeah. But we didn't have email questions back then. So we, we took advantage of being in a room with somebody. And that, that, actually, I'll, I'll throw something, not necessarily with Adam Ant, because that was actually about as formal as I did any interview for a long time. It was in a management office, which was very high polluting for me. But most of the interviews we did back in the day were in recording studios. They were backstage at gigs. They were in pubs. They were sometimes out in a park if that was the only place you could get some quiet and the tape recorder could pick things up. So there was an informality built into a lot of these situations. And the bands were often, just depending on the vibe, they might be having fun with you. You might get argumentative. All kinds of things could happen. So I think there was an informality built into most of that. Yeah. When you say fanzine, people, especially back then, think punk. And punk was certainly a central part of what jamming did. But as issue number one with Led Zeppelin on the cover indicates, jamming was much more than that. For me, and I'm sure for many other people, punk was not so much an end point, but actually a starting point, a door that opened into lots of other ideas, not all of them musical. and. The band I'm thinking of particularly is the Tom Robinson band. There is a, there, there's a, a photo of one of the earlier issues here that just brought me up short because it's, oh, here it is. I don't know if you can all see this, but up in the corner is an orange notepad from the Tom Robinson band with the, the, the fist and the power in the darkness. Tom Robinson was went to gay rights at a time when that sort of thing was actually dangerous and illegal yeah. still in England. Not illegal, but dangerous. Yeah. yeah. For two years, everything I wrote was written on one of these orange <laughs> Tom Robinson power in the darkness pads. Before there was like, before we used the term ally in that sense, Tom Robinson was making allies on both sides of the Atlantic. Just one example of the power of punk to be more than musical. And, and that, that also seemed to be something that you took I think without doubt, and without without getting too caught up in whether Tom Robinson was, was a, a, anybody's savior or not, I think that punk opened a door that for a lot of people, we walked through and never turned around, never came back. It, 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 it was a, it's not a lifestyle, it wasn't a fashion thing. I, I, I never wore um, any of the, the punk fashion. I didn't really wear much of the mod fashion that followed 
the mod revival fashion that followed either. It was really about attitude and about being independent. And I think you saw the floodgates really open about two, three years later when it just seemed every day I was, I'd go down to my, my, my leather box and there would just be all these self-pressed singles being sent to me from all over the UK in paper sleeves and photocopied sleeves and handwritten sleeves, just like such an exciting time. And I think that what punk did, but it took a couple of years to really filter through was just this idea that you can do what you want to do and you don't have to follow this sort of preordained path. And I do have to say, we're sitting here in, in New York City, which had its own punk movement that predated the British one at a, at a very artistic movement. One of the reasons punk had to happen, Britain was so straight, so straight laced, so formal, so societal, so classist. It was also falling apart. So something had to give. And what sort of gave was punk rock and the Sex Pistols and the Clash. And this thought for about a year that punk was the most dangerous thing in the entire world, considering that we had all, yeah, I mean, we had a, a civil war going on in Ireland. We had all kinds of other things going on, but somehow Johnny Rotten was public enemy number one. But it really felt that way. And nothing I've ever lived through since has come anywhere close to that, anywhere remotely close. It was really like the, the sex business could not play. They weren't allowed to play basically anywhere. They were banned, but just completely banned. You did, there was records you didn't hear on the But it really opened doors for people who just said, I want to be outside of this, this British society that's, that told me how I've got to live for the rest of my life. And I don't want to accept that. And I think it really helped us move to a place that I'm not sure we ever turned back, to be honest. Well, and very quickly, punk embraced the Afro-Caribbean culture, the Clash playing covers of Police and Thieves, the Two-Tone Movement. You had integrated bands, which even in the late 1970s had a little frisson like Benny Goodman's band in the late 1930s did. You know, it was like, oh, look at that. So that was another kind of door that opened through this music. It really was. And I was going back to school in South London. I school Kennington Oval, just up the road from Brixton. I had a band through all this period. We rehearsed actually above the Brixton Advice Centre because our drummer's mother managed the place. And we were surrounded by reggae music, completely surrounded by it. And the whole story about Don Letts, who actually went to my school, left before I started. But Don Letts was this DJ that I'm sure some of you directed videos for The Clash. But he was the DJ at the main London punk club, which, by the way, I was way too young to attend. I'm not trying to pretend I was in on the first wave of punk whatsoever. But he played reggae records because there were no punk rebel records to play. So the, the, so he was like, well, this Jamaican stuff is rebel music and everybody, the clash around, not, you know, all the, the bands were coming out of the same environments, Brixton, Notting Hill, Camden, a lot of the same kind of environments where you would hear reggae on the streets as well. So. I, I grew up hearing about, certainly going out and about, I would hear as much reggae blaring from bedrooms and record shops as I would new wave music. All of those neighborhoods you mentioned, neighborhoods you now can't move no. to, no. unless you're a Russian oligarch. <laughs> hey. Apparently not even now. You mentioned your band. The story of jamming goes in parallel with, kind of, with the story of you and your band and and the end of jamming, you you liken to the breakup of the band. That was was the the fanzine later magazine really a kind of parallel experience for you of of being a member of a rock band? In some ways, in that you invest so much in it, and you don't want to ever entertain the possibility that it might possibly have to stop at some point or quote fail. Um, closing is a form of failure if success is measured in the fact that you continue forever and things get bigger and better then having to stop is a measure of failure where it would be very different from a band is uh, if jamming was a band it would be with me as this there's somebody else used about bands the bands yeah had benign dictators they were either democracies or benign dictatorships. I'm sure it was somebody I interviewed for jamming. The point being there that I loved having people that, that could partner up in jamming and would write for us and really be take, come on the journey. But it did seem that every time I tried to have a partner, it was, it was hard for them to last the course. Maybe I was just really demanding on it. I was the one who would stay up at the printers all night and just keep pushing and pushing on it. And so I had a series of people who were like really collaborators for a period of time. And eventually they would be like, I got to move on because yeah, it's not like we're getting paid enough for this. But that was part of the story. Yeah. 
One of one of your collaborators was Better Badges. Mm-hmm. Can you explain who or what Better Badges? Sure. Was, why they were so important? Sure, absolutely. And uh, Jolly from Better Badges was actually going to be filming tonight. Um, he got called somewhere else. The band here is filming, but Jolly is actually going to be uploading the video that we're filming from this. Better Badges was just this sort of like linchpin in the UK. Jolly was a pretty young hippie who a lot of people around the punk movement were hippies. And and that was okay because they had also wanted an alternative society and it didn't quite happen with the hippie movement. So when they they saw punk and felt that, that the hair length was different, but the values were the same, Jolly was the guy who was printing up all the button badges. I guess you call them pins in America. Right. And he was a guy printing all of these up and pressing them up. I'm, I'm a firm believer that you make your own luck. Um, I think this is true in everything. I, you, know, you often see it in sport. If you don't, if you don't try, you can't score. That kind of that kind of thing. If you don't shoot, you can't score. You know what I mean? I went to Jolly from Better Badges to get an advert because it seems he was putting these ads in the, in lots of independent magazines or fanzines, and I was so struggling to find a printer that I could work with. I'd done two sort of commercial issues. I was still 14 years old, but I'd gone through two printers and the second experience was really bad. That'd be three including, but two commercial printers, bad experiences. And when I went to Jolly and, and, and we actually did an interview because he lives in New York and we did an interview after the book came out for the podcast series I did with it. He reminded me that he was actually getting a some kind of uh, scanner at the time and he could actually help with the initial plates for jamming. But quickly enough, he then was getting a printer so that he could print his own badges at a, be, you know, at a better price for himself and said, do you want to be a guinea pig? Like, I will print jamming for cost because I need to get the hang of this, this printer. And that suddenly solved all my problems. And we went through one issue that looked like somebody was testing out a printer. It's actually quite hard to find a copy of it where you could read everything. And then all of a sudden I was able to pull out a fancy that had value for money because um, I passed on those cost savings to the readers in, in terms of like bumper issues for not much money. And then suddenly he said, look, I've got to print some badges in blue. Should we do a page in blue? Or better yet, do you want to do a background in blue and we'll print black on top? By the way, black on blue does not work. I don't know why I kept just repeating that mistake issue after issue. Right. Um, but there are some other colors that work. So suddenly now we're printing in different colors. Now we've got a happening fanzine. But also, Jolly was based on the Port Bella Road, right by the Westway. Pretty much just a three minute walk from Rough Trade Ref. Fifth column that was quite important to me, a t-shirt company. The guy Robin Richards did a lot of uh, cover designs for jamming down the line. They would sell their t-shirts at the, the market on the Port Bella Road, uh, the Westway market on the weekends. So there was all this activity going on around there. So I now got in the position where we could print copies of jamming and I could literally take them off the printing press. We still had to collate and staple them, but I could do that and take some copies straight to Rough Trade, the same way that the Evening Standard would have these bands going around London every day. So now I was like in the hub of everything and it just made the world of difference. And then Better Badges grew its printing side as jamming grew. And that's, that's another story. And, and Jolly would be here to tell it himself. I think we both went through uh, explosive growths that, that wonderful, but also cash flow nightmares. For right. us. Yeah. Right. The, the thing mm. that strikes me about that whole scene, not the music scene, but the scene that grew up, the, the ancillary scene that grew up around it, the, the badges and the newspapers and the fan scenes and the, the concert present presenters and the club owners, is that you're talking about a kind of proto social media in the late 1970s before the digital age. When you look back on it, does it seem that way? Yeah, and actually when I was doing this podcast, a few people came up with that and said, you know, they literally said that, John. They said fanzines were our social media. Um, that, you know, it, a slower process, it should be said. And I have this whole other interesting little thing that's been going through my mind. This is not the question you asked, but the technology was slower then, but it felt like the, pro the, the, the process of innovation moved faster. And this is like a separate thing that's been going through my mind. And nowadays we can exchange all this information rapidly, but I don't necessarily feel that the creativity is speeding up. But back then you would send somebody your fanzine and put in there, can you, do you want to send me a copy of 
your own fanzine. So I might get, and I'd sometimes have to figure because I might get sent 20 different fanzines all asking for a copy of Jamming. And I may at times have felt, well, your fanzine is like four pages and mine's 44. And I'm not sure I want to send you a copy, but thanks for yours. So that's, that's probably where you get into plane wars. But those would be like letters that would come every week or so. And maybe somebody would occasionally send you an angry post, which is probably the equivalent of an angry kind of like tweet or something. But Did you have fanzine trolls? We had fanzine flame wars. Yeah, definitely. We had, there was, there was occasional, there were occasional animosities. When I did the first properly printed one, I just printed it very neat and tidy. And I got into, I got like assailed by other fanzines for being corporate. I was a 14 year old kid. I, like, <laughs> honestly, they, they, I think they thought I was some young adult trying to like take all the fun and adventure out of fanzine. But I just hadn't figured out how to do it yet. I just saw you, like, I read The Enemy, the type was printed vertically. I did, you know, like, top to bottom. I didn't realize you were meant to do it askew. So after a while, I got used to writing by hand in the margins and cutting things up and so on, yeah. But no, we got there, there were occasional controversy, but it's the same as bands, isn't it? And then when you eventually meet each other, you're all a little bit shy about it. You know, I don't, there weren't really any fist fights about any of this. I think probably if you put someone in a room with their internet troll, that you might find the same thing. There's suddenly like, look, yeah. shyness is one word for it. Cowardice might be another. But going back to what you said about the way ideas would travel, and it seems to, to have been pretty quick. I, I used to take the J train through East New York, Bushwick, Bed-Stuy, Williamsburg in the late 70s. And on a Saturday night, hip hop was being invented in the Bronx. On Monday morning, you'd hear it coming out of, we didn't call them boom boxes back then, but you'd hear it coming out of portable radios on the J train going through Brooklyn. That sound would happen really fast. It would move really fast from borough to borough. Did you have a similar kind of experience in London? I think we possibly did. I think that there were certain records that came out that you would be buzzing about at, at, at school or on the scene after I left school. I think that there, there were times where, you know, we had telephones just about, and, I, and, I, and I'm not being facetious because not everybody had a telephone. I think famously Morrissey didn't have a telephone at that in, into the eighties. So not everybody had telephones, but we did have telephones. So you would be calling up your friends saying, have you heard this record? Or if John Peel played something uh, one night, there is a good chance if everybody listening agreed with John Peel that it was the greatest thing, there's a good chance that you would need to rush to the record shop the next day because it would be sold out by the end of that day. And similarly, just talking about taking the fanzine sort of off the presses, once jamming got going and there was a, there was a couple of different golden periods, but if I'm thinking, I know we'd, we'd be got lots of speed up to, but 1979 when it was like very, when Jolly had started printing it, it was happening at that point. If I went to a gig with a new copy of Jamming, if I could like have a sports bag with 50 copies in it, there's a good chance I would come back with whatever 50 times 25 pence is in, in loose change, by the way, in the bag, <laughs> in, and, and which was a bit of a scary thing because I was always traveling by public transport with like pockets bulging with two P pieces, but people would be like, oh, new copy of Jamming, let me buy it. So it wasn't on the newsstands. It was going out to the independent shops, but people were, excited to get this stuff so there was a sense that people wanted they wanted that social media you know they were actively craving it in, in your book boy about town you recount traveling all around town and being on the scene what did it feel like to be a teenager and to, to be a kind of tastemaker really or as we might say today a gatekeeper yeah i often think about that in the sense that when you look back you realize that's what you were. I think in the midst of it, you're too busy having fun to really examine it. And I also firmly believe, I believe this at bands as well, if you self-analyze too much, I don't want to say there was magic about jamming, but you know, somebody else can say, but you lose whatever might be special. I think there was definitely a period that I, I, I remember when it first started happening that I would write something off the cuff and then somebody would, would be quoting it in the NME and I realized, oh, People are actually reading what I've got to say, and maybe I shouldn't be so flippant, which I probably still was, but but I think that it did occur to me at some point. And then, of course, you a little later down the line, 
you get record companies and publicists start actually calling you up and really pushing on you and you realize, oh, we, we've got a bit of influence. And then you do have to second guess it uh, to some extent. You have to think, all right, we can't just put every band up publicist rights in the, in the magazine. It's going to be justified to some extent. And I should also say that along the way, a lot more people got involved with writing for Jammy. It went from being a sort of one, one person in his schoolmates fanzine to being a, a magazine with a decent masthead of people who would also come to us with ideas. And that was very important as well. How did you score the, the Paul McCartney? I was in the studio with The Jam. I had become friends with The Jam. and I was running a record label with All Weather, for better or for worse. And I was in the studio, probably just being there at Air Studios, George Martin's studio. Paul McCartney walked in, which apparently he was getting in the habit of doing. And uh, it took me until he left the room to realize who that was. And when he came back in, I said to Paul, wow, that would be great to get to do an interview for Jamming. When he came back in, we asked him. And he, he was like, yeah, do you have a copy of the fanzine on you? And I always did. That was just something I always did. It's your calling card. My calling card. My, yeah, literally, my business yeah. card. Yep. And he said, uh, all right, let's do it tomorrow. And did he know who you were? Did he know Jamming? No, he did just No, no, at all. Yeah. No, he did it. And that, that's, there's a lot of, I said, if you don't shoot, you can't score. There's a lot of you, you don't ask, you won't get. And that the interesting appendix to the story is the year. Because it was 1982. Two. Yeah, very early, 82, like January, February. And John Lennon had been assassinated at the end of 1980. Yeah. And Becca hadn't really done no, he anything. Hadn't. No, he hadn't. No. So what you got was the kind of exclusive that the enemy would have killed for. Yeah, and he probably wasn't looking to talk to the enemy. He was finishing up the Tug of War album, and he certainly went out and did his promo for it. And that's one of, not surprising, that's one of the cassettes I'd held on to. And I, I have listened back. I'm not sure what, if, if, you know, if anything will happen to it commercially. But yeah, I think he got a little bit of a buzz out of tour. I was 17 at the time, and we talked about two and a half hours. And he was, he, it was really interesting because he did his bit of putting me at rest or almost trying to be pally with me. I mean, he said about when he was met John Lennon, he had the, uh, the fate of the outdoor Thing. He said, yeah, John Lennon had a bit of a quip, a bit like yours. And he was saying things to me like that. And by the way, I never had a quip. I had a Billy Idol spiky hair. So that would make it even weirder. It was very odd. He was like, yeah, but he would also pat you. And he was like sat right alongside me, much closer than we are. And he would like pat me to emphasize a point. It's, it's, yeah, it's quite something. You mentioned there were a couple of golden ages, golden periods for jamming. One was working with J Jolly and yeah. her badges. What were some of the others? I think when we first went bi-monthly, there was a period where I was so busy with that record label that jamming became unfortunately like an annual. And it was right around that Paul McCartney interview. There were great issues, but they came out once a year and I wish they hadn't. And then I made up for lost time. Well, let yeah. me interrupt just to yeah. ask a, a kind of a follow-up. Sure. With jamming on such an irregular schedule, when you got an interview like the McCartney, did it ever occur to you to shop it to one of the big music magazines instead of... Well, do you know the answer to that with the McCartney interview? I don't. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So now the McCartney interview did get shopped. I, this is a longer story that I have written about. It's in the book in part. It got printed by the Sunday Mirror in the UK. And the, the reason was I, yet again, had no money to print the fancy. And I literally took the money and put it into printing the fancy. And it enabled us to jump from printing sort of three, four thousand to printing twelve, thirteen thousand. I in hindsight I'm not remotely proud of doing that. The only aspect of it being that I didn't do it for myself. I, I do remember. Yeah, that's that that's a story, it's a part of the story of, of jamming, but uh, that's what happened with the McCartney interview. But I think when we went by month, I realized these occasional steps up, and this was the one about getting into news agents. And we found a good distributor, we got a printing deal. And I used a sort of a little bit of the royal we here. And then contributors start, started coming on board. People got really excited. One of them is here in the room tonight, Chris Heath. He was very much a part of the jamming success story of, in terms of writing for us and helping the magazine become a really good magazine. And I think there's a few issues, where, particularly these bi-monthly ones, which are like issues 15 to 20. The layout is pretty haphazard at times. 
pages are still in the wrong this times pages are still unreadable i think chris's first ever article is black on blue and completely unreadable we still <laughs> hadn't learned that lesson uh, i really don't think you can read it whatsoever but there was a lot of life to it a lot of energy to it and there were a lot of young writers coming on board and saying i love this it's like some weird cross between smash hits and the enemy and can i write for you can i take photos for you there's a great band in my neighborhood it was that was a good fun period and i look back on that very fondly yeah and what happened the distributors talked me into going monthly and i understand why because they said bi-monthly that's every two months of course is the worst of all worlds it's like the the news agents don't know when you're next coming they don't really focus on it you're almost better off being quarterly than being every two months so rather than saying good idea let's go quarterly I let them talk me into going monthly and then we're still teenagers largely. And this is run and this is like trying to run a sprint before you can walk it. It was crazy. The cash, the backing was not there. It was being done on an overdraft at the bank. And in the late in the early eighties, um, interest rates in Britain were about twenty percent. It was just insane. Somebody should have just said no. And nobody did. And so we've got on this roller coaster putting out a uh, uh, a magazine every month and managing to keep it going, but it ended up getting investors. And again, there's some really good copy in all of that there in the book, but it just, it, it was not making money. It was kind of every time you brought out another issue, you just seem to end up further in debt. And yet the, from the public perspective, they see it on the newsstands and, and see that you're getting some big name interviews and figure you're going to be doing great. And yet, you, you know, I got flown to Dublin to interview you two as the first interview for the unforgettable fire they wanted jamming to be the first interview and when i, I wasn't a big fan of you two so i i wanted somebody else to do it and then they came out and said no it has to be you so it was like you know we were getting all those things but at, at the same time an 18 19 year old shouldn't be running a business of that size and i was trying to run it i asked you before about parallels between your life as a magazine editor and as a member of a rock band as I'm sure you well know, many ostensibly successful rock bands are just not me. But no. And the definition of a successful tour is a tour where you don't lose money. And the idea that you can be successful and also failing financially seems weird to us as Western capitalists, but in the arts, it's, it's really common. And, and when you actually read back, uh, there's a whole bunch of memoirs coming out now from, from that period that we're talking about. And the, the common thread is the band saying, yeah, we had a hit record. We're on top of the pops and we were getting 30 pounds a week. And with a band, to be fair, if you've got that hit record and you wrote it, everybody will tell you, if you can just hold on, the royalties will follow. If nothing else, the publishing royalties will follow. Unless you've sold them. The well, you're guaranteed certain songwriting income in yeah, you know, by law it has to come to you, a certain amount of it. The records side of it, you can keep but you know, a lot of bands just sell more records and get more in debt to the record company. So that part's not uncommon. But that's the one difference. For us it was thirty pounds a week, but we just seem to be printing more copies and it's just difficult. I mean I, I, nobody to blame but me. I mean I'm I'm the one who decided to to, to do it. But a lot of people had a lot of fun along the way. And I, I've got to say, putting this book together after all these years, I genuinely, you were asking about that question about when did I realize taste made the kind of thing that I'm still not quite sure. I, when I put this book together, I thought, well, let me try and track down some of the people who wrote for, for Jamming. I know where some of them are, some are still friends, but a lot of people I don't know. I was genuinely, truly humbled by, uh, how much jamming had meant to so many people who were part of the story. Genuinely and, and truly humbled because, well, you know, we've all moved on. Some people stayed in professional journalism, photography. Some people went into me other forms of media. Some did other things, but everybody looked back fondly. And, and that meant the world to me, it really did. How was it for you as a teenager and just entering your 20s? As you've gotten to the point where it's a glossy magazine, it looks slick, fancy into all on your back because you've sold out and you're still a kid. How did you, were you it to keep any kind of control over this enormous battleship that you would set sail on? 
Yes and no. I think I kept a pretty good control over it until the very last few issues of the magazine when it went a bit pear shaped and and because of that it got because of that I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. And when I told the investors that, they said, well, it's not making money, so we'll close it. And it was so, so it was really only right at the end that I think I lost control. And how old were you then? And so they closed in the 86, I was 21. Yeah. That's a kind of amazing kind of bookmark for a 21 year old. I think when you figure that most people, particularly in the States and more so in the UK these days, do aspire to go to college. It's, you could almost say this was just a very, very expensive college course. <laughs> In what? In <laughs> media studies? <laughs> but the but music more, world? Betting more than that. Yeah, the music world, it's so different right now. My, my 17-year-old son, is he spends half his day at BOCES, which some of us will know what that is, cooperative services between different school districts doing music production like a half day, and then he comes home and tells me what he's been doing and the discussions they've been having, and I'm bowled over and knocked out and amazed. And I say to him, had that been on offer to me at 16, I might have stayed at school. I instead got this offer, Paul Weller said, you fancy running a record label together. And I went, yes, I'll leave school and do that. The world is just different. The world just is different. Nowadays, more people in Britain will stay on at school. The, there is more that you can do with music, similar things in universities, colleges. Back then, there was none of it, and the pubs and clubs were full of teenagers playing music and putting out fans in. It was a very young, very young scene, really young. Do you still hear echoes of that scene today? Music be, I believe. Yeah, music be, for sure. For sure. I think some of the bands that were around then have had such a lasting influence, as much as any period of any bands, I think, yeah. I, I want to give you folks a chance to ask Tony some questions. One more question for you, though, before we do sure. that. You mentioned several times in the book, early on, a band that I was a big fan of and that I thought nobody else would. Bebop Deluxe. I know Love them. Here in the States, I saw Bebop Deluxe open for Leonard Skinner. I went to a <laughs> Leonard Skinner concert <laughs> simply because I wanted to see Bebop Deluxe. When Bill Nelson played a live extended version of Adventures in the Yorkshire Landscape, that was as far from the punk rock that I loved as, as, any, as classical music was. It was like this wonderful English pastoral music. And yet he was a uh, Bebop Deluxe was one of a handful of groups that bridged um, the end of glam rock, the hard rock period into punk. Um, uh, it, maybe it, it, Ultravox might be another. They jumped a bit more onto onto punk rock earlier. Bebop Deluxe were making this sort of art rock that was not like other rock. Now, funny enough, I played my favorite album, Sunburst Finish, just the other week in the car to my son. It, a couple of places it sounded more dated. But I also was reading about Bill Nelson literally last night because there's a, a, an excellent book just came out um, in the UK, a memoir somebody our age called No One Round Here Reads Tolstoy it's by a guy, Mark Hawkinson, who uh, came from a very working class environment and just became a voracious reader, then became a publisher. And he was a big boy, Bebop Deluxe fan. And he actually contacted Bill Nelson and said, let me put out uh, your diaries that you write on your blog. Would you like to put them out? So he put out a couple of books by Bill Nelson. And uh, I have to say about Bill, when he formed a more of a sort of new wavish band, Red Noise, I went through the front door for the first time. I called up publicists and I sent them a copy of my fanzine and I said how much I loved Bill. They lined up an interview and they called me the night before to blow it out and said, Bill Nelson's got to get his shit together. And it's saying so non-punk rock. And I, they'd already told me where we were going to do it, which is where, what is now the Brixton Academy. I said that I went to school around then. So I simply went up there in the morning and waited. <laughs> And when he showed up in a chauffeur-driven car, I, I guess I doorstepped him. He said he knew nothing about the interview or the cancellation, he invited me in to, for the whole day, sat down, gave me an hour's interview, invited me to stay and watch the dress rehearsal. Uh, I formed the friendship with the drama that I've got until this day. And he was an absolute gentleman. I have a really soft spot to Bill Nelson. Hey, hey. Glad to see him getting some props. 40 years later. <laughs> At least, yeah, he would be here 40 years later, yeah. All right. Questions. 
in the back. Tony, it's Ben. I just want to say I saw Bill Nelson open and we bought the last open for Blue Oyster Cult. We're back in the day. If it helps, the Jam did a tour with Blue Oyster Cult as well. And apparently it almost broke them up. So, I mean, I think British bands in America had to take what tours they could get for a while. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, during the whole period you're doing jamming, were you living at home? Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. I was living up throughout this period. Um, I mentioned my dad wasn't around. Uh, that my parents got divorced quite when I was about seven. Um, my older brother moved out when I was 15. He was 18. And I had a, a really strong relationship with my mother that was more almost like roommates. And that was probably the one thing that saved me sorry, in terms of not earning money was the fact that I was at home. My mother, however, this is what people did in the UK. I don't know if they did in America. It was a really big disappointment when I told her I was leaving school because my older brother had already not gone to college and she was a teacher and university graduate and, and it was a big disappointment. So she said, like, it went on for a few weeks and eventually said, if you're going to do this and do your magazine, you've got to pay rent. So I did pay rent. And that was very typical in British families. It's like, if you leave school, you get a job, you can stay here and pay rent. So it was nominal, but I paid rent. So when this time went on, you earned her respect though, right? Oh yeah, she was totally behind it from day one. Unfortunately for her, actually, it was her name on the bank overdraft. Uh, it, was, it was her house that was collateral on the bank overdraft. So it's fair to say we ran into some difficulties down the line. That, that, that's a much longer story. She got to hold on to the house, I'm glad to say. I think the bank was at fault for loaning me money and we actually got, we were pretty much able to prove as much. And it, 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 it all ended just about okay. But no, she was probably too supportive of me, of anything, to be quite honest. Part, part two, what was your best interview and your worst interview, if you can remember and why? My favorite interview, can I give the favorite? Yeah, yeah. My favorite remains, I think I'd probably say, he was interviewing the Damned in 1980 in eight track studio, right next to the Crystal Palace football ground. It was uh, Captain Sense one day Banyan, and we'd been after them for ages, and it was one of these getting through the back door. We eventually found the captain at the bar at the South London gig, me and some friends, and we pestered him and he called me up the next night at home and said, all right, come to the studio. Four of us showed up and there was no alcohol involved. So I remember that, but it was the funniest night of my life. And it was also quite scary. The captain was just so funny and Vanian was actually quite scary. It, it was just, I think you had to be there. You had to be 16 at the time, but but it's reprinted. One page is black on blue, but it, it's, it's, it's reprinted. The comments, I think my favorite comment in there is he says about, uh, he knew that we liked the jam and he was just trying to wind us up relentlessly. He said, oh yeah, but the, well, the drummer from the jam came up to me once and said, said, I wish I could dye my hair like you, but my mum won't let me. And I'm sure he made that up, but it was just like the whole night was full of that, the whole night. Uh, that was my favorite. The worst is probably not, I, I, I don't really remember any really terrible interviews. I think sometimes they would just be boring. Um, I never had one that was like threatening to get to fisticuffs or anything like that. I know that we did a podcast, uh, we did a 10 part podcast series if anybody's interested, the Jamming Fans in podcast. I did one with Chris, who's here, with, uh, with the photographer Russell Young. Chris had a very interesting story of Frankie Goes to Hollywood, where it, it turned violent as they left the pub. And that was, that was really interesting. I never actually had anything quite like that. Nothing quite so confrontational. Just sometimes you came home and you went, I guess I said I'd write about them, but maybe it'd be a page instead of three pages. You're a very lucky man. I speak from bitter experience. Yeah. Anybody else? Questions for Tony? Come on. There's nothing you hear. <laughs> no? Tony. Yeah. Good ask you this. Personally, I'll ask you. You know, in, in here. So, I'm guessing that after, I know that after jamming, you went on to work, at least as an interviewer, on the tube on TV. The famous Morrissey interview that how did that happen? Moving on. When it sounds like jamming ended and then you... No, it was actually while jamming was going, Paul. Yeah. Um, so the question was just about, about working on the tube, <laughs> meaning a TV show, not the London Underground. But they did a story about jamming for the first series. And then basically invited me up for what I realized afterwards was an audition. They didn't say it was an audition. And then they, they literally asked if the you know, said, we would like to hire you as an occasional presenter on the second series. And that was another case of 
being just dropped in the deep end, no mentoring whatsoever, none. It's just like first week up, I was meant to be doing a certain amount of work, I think, including interviewing Elvis Costello, but uh, Paula Yates was, and very quickly, Leslie Ash had done the first show of the second series, and this was the second show, and she was there the day before, but she got sick that night, and suddenly I had all this extra work thrown at me and I was like straight in the deep end of the tube. People who don't know went out live, 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 not even a five second delay, not even a three second delay. It went out live from Newcastle in a studio with three stages and a band, a green room with a bar. Um, the bands were drinking. It was, you know, people would grab you and, and everything went on. And that two weeks later, I was interviewing Wham! who were up against a stage with all these teenage girls pressed around them and the one security guy was in the job's work of like trying to just gently hold the girls back. Very strange period. I'm glad to have had the opportunity. I wish I'd had a little bit of, of training and I might have done a better job. At least we're getting paid. I was getting paid for that and actually, uh, yeah, I was getting paid for that, which enabled me to keep my wage low and jamming and pay other people to help head it. Yeah, pay the rent to mom. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Yes. I never interviewed Ray Davies from the Kinks. No, um, I met him a couple of times. Lovely guy. We didn't interview many of the older rock stars. I got to interview Pete Townsend twice. Uh, once when I was 14, he was my idol. He sort of still is, although idol is a weird word to, to use. But we didn't really, other than uh, McCartney and Townsend, I don't really think we went back to the 1960s in terms of original artists. I know the Kinks were still making records. Yeah, I think if jamming had gone longer, we'd have probably ended up a bit more like a mojo and had this long expanse of let's look back as we look forwards, but we didn't really get to do that. In the mid-70s, when I started interviewing people like Phil Manzanera from Roxy Music or Robin Lovely from Brand X, one of my go-to questions would be, what do you think, you who are not a punk rocker, what do you think of punk rock? And all these guys, I think they were all guys mostly back then they all loved it even though it was not their thing he tells him did you ever did did you ask him what he thought oh yeah he was hoping at the time that it would enable the who to split up and get taken over it didn't quite work out that way but i mean it sort of did he did eventually break the band up for, for for a number of years yeah he was more than happy to get out of the way for a period i think most interesting people like robert plant went down to the roxy in the vortex keith moon did I think everybody, I have a similar attitude. I, I love seeing young bands tell old people they're boring old farts. We aren't, I think we're, we, we're doing okay, but yeah, I'm kind of all for that, yeah. But I will say, I think that one of the things that I think punk made a difference on was that generation carried on attending gigs and never felt like they'd been too old to go to gigs. And I will tell you that when I was going to a lot of gigs in 1979, if there was a 25-year-old in the room, they looked old. And I really mean that. I really mean that. And I think that is one of the changes that we no longer have this sort of ageism that, that we've all come to understand that even if you can't pogo down the front and you really shouldn't go in the mosh pit because you'll embarrass yourself, you're still welcome to, to be at the show. You know, there, there's many a concert in normal times here in New York where you will spot David Byrne if he's not doing his American Utopia show. He is a common sight at your yeah. clubs. So you're absolutely right. It used to be, you're 50, time to go to the symphony. It's great to go to the symphony, but it's also great to still go to the clubs. Yes. Yes. So what was the genesis for the name and what was the sort of alternate? Uh, the genesis for the name and, and, and the second part was the alternate? Like the, the runner up. Oh, originally I, I called it In The City after a jam song, the first jam single album. And then the same Tom Robinson wrote to tell me, I was asking for an interview and he wrote and said, there's already a fanzine called In The City, which was actually named after an Ultravox song. The reason I called it Jamming with the Jam, and I can't deny that it wasn't on my mind, but it was the Bob Marley song. It just seemed to like sum up what I wanted to do with the fanzine. And I'm still happy with that. I almost feel like if the Jam had been called a different band, I might still have called it Jamming, but you know, there was a period where everybody thought we were some kind of jam fancy when I actually worked really hard to not write about the jam, considering that I was like good friends with them. I would actually not interview them and not write about them to some extent. That is, you're keeping your journalistic neutrality. That's, again, for a teenager, pretty impressive. 
All right. Well, okay. So, yeah. are we done? I think we're, yeah. I think I just got the, they used to do that on the tube behind the camera. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, wind it up. All right. It's not quite the shepherd's crook around the neck, but it'll do. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Tony Fleck. And thank you to John uh, for doing this so far for the price of a beer. I really appreciate John doing this. We do have some books up here at the map. I can hang out in a little bit. We can move next door. And if anybody wants to get any of them signed, thank you again. Really appreciate it coming out.